And I imagine that it's the experience of other Christians as well. And so when I'm tempted to, to cave in, even when I think I'm going the right direction, I listen to counsel that will fortify my spine, put my legs back under me, and help me stick to my guns. Isn't it amazing how the, the right person expressing their support can get us back on track when we falter. There is something about the empowering help of a confidant that boosts our spirits back onto course. And the Psalms know that our need for that sort of support is part of the human experience especially as we walk with the Lord. So in Psalm 4, we find David in the middle of a situation where his judgment and his ability as king is called into question. People are speaking against him, and we'll think about who they are and, and why, it's, why their identity is significant as we go. And as they speak against him, David needs help as he processes and reacts to those criticisms. And looking at how David prayed through that experience in Psalm 4, we learn how it comes to bear on our lives too. After all, we need to remember that the Psalter aims at our instruction. That purpose of instruction includes many applications Uh, And as this book contains diverse kinds of psalms, sorts of psalms that express praise, lament, trust, despair, contentment, rejoicing, and so forth, one application of the Psalter considered as a whole is that it instructs us about the godly response to the full spectrum of experience and emotion that we encounter in the Christian life. The psalms train us for how to process and react to whatever this life throws at us, especially in how we we bring those things to God. With that emphasis on how Psalm 4 ought to help us, we can ask, then, how, how does Psalm 4 fit into the book of the Psalter? Even though, rightly, each psalm can stand alone to leave us with important things to to learn about God and and how to walk with Him, we are also trying to think about the Psalter as a book that is about something that starts somewhere, goes somewhere, and ends somewhere. And what does Psalm 4 contribute to this developing book? Psalms 1 and 2, as we saw, are the two-part intro to the whole book of Psalms. We saw Psalm 1 teaches us that the Psalter is about the law in as much as it teaches us to delight in God's law. And then Psalm 2 taught us that the Psalter is about the gospel in that it, it is about the Psalm 2 and the book as a whole is about the king who is God's son claiming the nations as his inheritance to give blessing to all who take refuge in him. And in Psalm 3, we learned that God's promise that his king will defeat the nations who rage against him. That promise doesn't undermine, that, that promise from the heavenly perspective doesn't undermine that at the earthly level, we experience real hardship as the nations rage against God, his king, and his people. And Psalm 3 and 4 both concern the king facing opposition. And that will be the theme, really, in a sense, of of all of Book 1, all of Psalms 1 to 41. And in that regard, we come to our consideration of those, those three questions that guide how we might reach a full sense of how to... Uh, understand, interpret, apply every psalm. 
what caused the psalmist to write this song, this psalm, song? Uh, how does it apply to my life, and how does it take us to Christ? And so the main point is that Psalm 4 instructs us to depend on what God has said more than on the fear of other people. Psalm 4 instructs us to depend on what God has said more than to fear other people. And our three points, which line up, if, if that wasn't obvious, which line up to those three questions that we have before us are criticism, confidence, and contentment. So first, let's think about criticism. Uh, as, as is the case with, with many psalms, uh, we cannot pinpoint with certainty, with certainty, the exact historical background behind Psalm 4. We can, however, discern one aspect of the situation. So there in verse 2, when, when David writes, O men, well, it's translating a, a phrase that taken, taken together indicates men of status. Right? Namely, we would infer here, rightly, that um, this situation is about the king's own leaders. He's talking to his cabinet, so to speak. And so David's own cabinet of counselors and officers, those closest confidants, are questioning his competence and ability to lead well. That's, that's the issue at at stake, and that informs why he would say, How long shall my honor be turned into shame? They, they were taking his position as Israel's king and turning it into a, a reason to deride him as they thought he was coming up short. And strikingly, that, that means that Psalm 3 and 4 are both about uh, the king's concern about opposition within his own ranks. Right? Psalm 3 was about uh, Absalom, his son, turning against him to try to, to take the kingdom from him. And that makes Psalm 4 fit well into the Psalter's developing concern about the challenge against God's king. And it also furthers the shocking plot twist that the, from Psalm 2, right? That the nation that rages most against God's king turns out to be his own people. The king's own servants turn his glory into his shame. Now commentators have uh, various suggestions about what might have caused David's subordinates to question him. The, the remark in verse 7 about joy in relation to the harvest causes some to understand the background here to be a lack of rain and, and falling um, and, and, a, and a failing harvest, sorry. So the, there's a lack of rain, there's a drought, and the harvest isn't coming. And so, for example, like we read in 2 Samuel 21 of the problematic drought there, that uh, one of the things going on is there's a famine and a drought, and kind of in the scope of that effort at reconciliation, well, the, the, although it's in some degree, I mean, it, it appears in the background, but it, but it actually is framing the story, starting on the famine and, and coming to end on how uh, well, after these actions of reconciliation, rain comes. Well, in the ancient context, as it is focusing on David there, um, the agricultural societies thought that their nation's prosperity in harvest in some way depended upon the king and his faithfulness and success. And so, I mean, it may be, it may even be that those events that David's servants presumed a national drought, a national famine, was about his failure as king. Right now, 
That's one. I mean, I think that's a helpful way to, to think about it. Um, we're not, we don't have certainty that that's the background, that those are the events. This psalm might be less specific in its origins too, growing out of you know, non-concrete historical background for David's uh, companions, colleagues, leadership, fellow leadership to turn against him. It could be still tied to that same situation of Psalm 3, where Absalom won the hearts of Israel away from David. So he, maybe he's writing about those leaders whose hearts were stolen by Absalom, so that many of them came to question, because of deceit, came to question his kingship. And regardless of what the specific events in the background may have been, all of them point us to see that people turned on David. They turned against him as their king. And as always, as we move from you know, what's the setting to the structure, you know, the structure of a psalm always helps us, as we, as we dive into these uh, texts of poetry, the structure of a psalm helps us perceive its, its main point. And Psalm 4, as I understand it, has three main sections. In verse 1, we have, we have the only plea. Verse 1 is the, is the request of the whole psalm. Verse 1 is, is David's cry, his petition, as he calls out for God to help him in distress, to hear his prayer, and to give him gracious aid. And then verses, so we we open with David's plea, and then verses 2 to 7 include David's reflection on the whole situation as as he describes, you know, more, he he moves from his petition to describing the problem and how he responds to his accusers. And then in verse 8, he states his conclusion. He tells us, after telling us all the things that he needs to work through before the Lord, he tells us then that he is at peace because God is on his side. That is the determining factor at the end of all things. In peace, I will both lie down and sleep. I won't just lay there tossing and turning. I will both lie down and I will sleep in peace. Because you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Because God causes his well-being. David is happy to go to sleep at night and to rest well. And that flags another thing to, to note about this psalm's use. I mean, even as we think about the patterns of our own lives, as we saw last time, Psalm 3 was a morning prayer framed in light of how David has woken up in the morning. He has been, he has slept through the night. God has preserved him so that he woke up the next morning trusting the Lord, knowing that he had been cared for by God. So Psalm 3 starts this stretch of prayers as a morning prayer. And you probably see where this is going, that here at the end of Psalm 4, we see that it's an evening prayer, offered not after David has woken up, but before he goes to sleep. David offers it in trust before he lies down. So he wakes up, Declaring praises to the Lord that even in the midst of distress, you have upheld me through the night in my most vulnerable state. And he seeks the Lord before he goes to sleep. And so in other words, Psalms 3 and 4 show us the pattern of seeking after the Lord. In one sense, in in what it means to pray without ceasing. In another way, showing us the, the stated practices of seeking the Lord morning and evening. And that, of course, informs why we 
try to observe the, the means of grace by practicing morning and evening worship on the Lord's Day, because the Lord's Day is meant to be the compressed practice, distilling for you what the rest of the Christian life looks like as we move through the routines, the patterns, the rhythms of praise, confession, and believing the gospel in one service. Well, the day itself is teaching us about walking with the Lord. As we wake with the Lord, and we lie down with the Lord as well. And so David faced serious criticism, forcing us to reckon with times that we come under fire. And that brings us to our second point, confidence. Confidence. If David's concern was about how his seemingly closest allies were calling his uh, his ability, his dependability, and his calling, his, his vocation as the nation's leader into question, uh, how does that prayer come to bear on our lives? And there's a sense in which, I mean, it, it's easy to feel the, if you have any sort of leadership position, uh, it's easy to feel the edge on this psalm. I mean, as a, as a pastor, you don't feel like you're ever very far off from having your competence called into question. That's that's not a particular worry I I have amidst our church, but it's it's at the same time not uncommon that churches might react to the least deviation from what someone wants. That's a, a move to lead the charge about how the idiotic the pastor must be. And yet, that's, that's not unique to pastors by any stretch of the imagination. Every vocation seems to have instant application. To this. And, I, and by vocation, I don't mean the things you're paid to do. I mean all the things the Lord calls you to do. In our marriages, how quickly can we go from feeling confident that we've served our spouse imperfectly well to feeling like they think we've let them down seriously. And golly, as parents, maybe especially if your kids are teenagers, uh, it doesn't take much for them to call your wisdom into question. (laughs) How many of us have had some great idea at work only shot down before it even got off the ground at all? And perhaps often, amidst, in some ways, what is our closest counsel, do we so frequently call ourselves into doubt? The Lord couldn't have given me this to do. I can't do this. I don't have the strength or the ability. We become our own accuser. Now, for whatever calling may be before you, whether it be specific, this, this instance of doing my vocation, or the broader, this is my vocation. Now, some of these situations shouldn't lead, shouldn't, they can. Some of these situations shouldn't lead to Psalm 4 level of distress in some ways. And yet the situation is the same when the exact thing that should honor us is, is flipped around to shame us. We're given this to do, and it ought to be an honor to walk before the Lord in that vocation, and yet here that vocation is turned against us to shame us. People believe false things about each one of us, and use those lies against us. We believe false things about ourselves and use those lies against ourselves. There is no doubt that the fear of man, the the inclination to crumble before difficult human opinion, is horrifically easy to indulge. It's the thing that the fear of man. Not even what they might do to us in a physical sense. That raised eyebrow 
of a close friend can bring us to our knees. And David's response in verse 3 helps us. He responds to opposition, but (laughs) that great word signaling contrast, right? They have stood against me. They are calling me into question. But know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. And I think he's talking to himself foremost. I mean, he's praying to God, I understand that, but I think, I think as he, he prays this to God, he's, he's trying to bring that reality home in his own mind and heart. His, he, needs, he needs himself to be grounded in this truth. God sets apart those who are his. God has appointed us to our vocations. God hears us when we call. His point is that God is the one who called him in a very real way to his position as king. He would not have been king were it not for God putting him in that role. And the line of application is pretty direct, isn't it? Christian God is the one who has called you to your marriage, to your family role, to your work role, to to the way that you are engaged in serving this church, to any vocation, whether it be paid or not. That is not the thing. Your, Your job is not the thing in our focus here. The things God has called you to do is our focus. Sometimes people truly prove themselves to be disqualified. Um, Which which I'm using in relation really to some, uh, something obvious. I don't mean the, the, somebody didn't like how I did that. I I don't mean the the occasional criticism. I don't mean the, the lack of self-confidence. I mean, we can disqualify ourselves for certain vocations by obvious moral faults. But apart from that, the, the obvious objective things, we have to remember that God gives us the roles that we have. Our vocations come from somewhere. A calling entails a caller. And those vocations are gifts. They are given. And to put it more bluntly, as we kind of circle our thoughts around David's response there, when God is on your side, when God wants you in the role that you have, we ought to be helped to have sure footing as we press ahead amid criticism. God has put you there. Someone else doubting your competence is not the defining factor of the situation. God's call is. And so we come to why we have focused on we, we have to give more credence to what God has said. God said David is the king. God has said you are Meant for whatever vocations you have. And we listen to that more than we listen to the fear of man. David sends his critics to consider that very point more fully. They can be upset if they want about the situation as it disappoints them. But they cannot let that stray into sinfulness. Be angry, but do not sin. A challenging thing, set of things to keep together. (laughs) Uh, Probably best to to try not to find that line and and just work on half of it. Uh, But they can be upset 
if they like, as long as they don't let that veer into sinful questioning of, of God himself. They should think, I mean, it, it is distressing, right, to have a famine, if that's the case, or distressing to think your leader isn't competent. They should think long and hard about their criticisms before letting them fester into real resentment of, of the Lord or the, the human leader. They should attend, offer sacrifices, right? They should attend the means of grace since the sacrifices were the Old Testament sacraments of that era, the, the equivalent of tangible things that confirm our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, confirmed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and gave Christ and his benefits to them by faith. So they should attend. I mean, the, the application I'm after there is obvious, right? They should attend the means of grace and especially should use the means of grace in conjunction with true trust in God, as should we. They should call on the Lord, but look to him to grant peace. And as we should imitate, David reminds himself of how the Lord considers him. Regardless of whether the situation was a a drought or not, David concludes that God's disposition toward him God's disposition is better than all of the harvest fully gathered in abundance. Even as his critics assail him, he goes to bed and he rests at ease. Calvin put it this way. The sum is that he had more satisfaction in seeing the reconciled countenance of God beaming upon him than if he had possessed garners full of corn and cellars full of wine. In other words, God's favor upon you, what God has said, ought to outweigh and outshine human criticisms, especially when they are false. We find confidence when we listen to what God has said more than to our fears of others' opinions. And that brings us to our final point, contentment, contentment. To be on the nose, how do we see Christ? (laughs) In Psalm 4. That's where we've come. And it becomes really obvious, I think, when we realize, as, as we take account of the full scope of the situation here, we see Christ so clearly when we realize that we are the people who so often question the leadership of the true and ultimate David, King Jesus. When he doesn't give us what we want, we can be quick to ask that question, why would he withhold the good things we need? When he doesn't answer our prayers in the ways that seem obvious to us, we can doubt that he even heard us. We tend to be the king's citizens. We are the king's citizens, and we tend to be those who turn against him and call his judgment into question. In that respect, how deeply ought we to be moved to thankfulness that while David's disposition comes to ultimate fulfillment in how Jesus Christ valued the Father's approval in his calling more than what the people said. He was committed to do what the Father gave him to do, 
even though the people turned that glory into shame. He set aside all the criticisms that he received as the people pushed him to cater to their desires rather than to fulfill his divine mission, his divine vocation. And Christ took satisfaction in the joy of doing what the Father had tasked him to do. So that as Hebrews would tell us, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, even while despising the shame. His glory, as God the Son, was turned into his shame as the people crucified him for being the king of the Jews. But he laid down in that very sleep of death because he knew that the Lord would restore him and vindicate him and show him to be right. And he knew that his sacrifice transcended a temporary loss so that he would redeem his people by his saving work. He found contentment in his distress by assuring himself of the Lord's approval in his obedience unto death. And we find contentment in distress in the Lord's approval given to us through Jesus Christ. Because in him we have the final stamp of what God has said justified, my beloved, those are mine. I have called them to myself. I have called them for my purposes. And that is where we rest. We rest our whole persons there. We rest our heads there as we go to sleep. And sleep at ease in the hands of our God. Let us pray. Almighty God, how glad we are that what you say of us outweighs, ought to outshine, certainly transcends what the world might say about us. That wherever you have called us to be and to serve, that is where we ought to be. Sometimes we disappoint others, sometimes we disappoint them for genuine reasons where we do not come through perfectly. Sometimes we disappoint them for invalid reasons, where they shouldn't be disappointed. Amidst it all, whatever sort of disappointment, we are glad to know that you call us to all of our vocations. And we are glad that you have called us to yourself, and that ultimately, Our glory in belonging to the Lord Jesus Christ as his saints can never be turned into our shame before you. The world may shame us for it, but it remains honor nonetheless to be stamped with the name of the Lord Jesus Christ as those who belong to him by faith. Fill our hearts with delight in that. Change our distress into confidence as you did for David and help us to rest well as we pray to you before we sleep each night. We ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Amen. As we come...